for a democracy like Canada that uh, to restore the sovereign power and the you know the, the regulation authority should be for public interest, right? Uh, so in that sense, Canada shares the historical responsibility with the United States that you have to bring the power back to the state. I'd like to respond to that. Um, I think Paul's got something you'd like to say. Yeah, I have something to say real quick. Uh, one of my uh, three countries of which I'm a citizen of, Mexico, uh, had a very promising, uh, had a very promising, I was born in Mexico, had a very promising uh, direction leading into the into the 80s and the impact of NAFTA on Mexico was to destroy Mexico okay people people it's it, it's not a question it, it, it is it is it is it is part of the problem that that uh, can will not be resolved until until Mexico is developed and you shut down the drug trade um, what was done was um, prior to the Mexican Revolution in 1910, essentially was a feudal system, and the the, the, the peons you might call them fought fought and died to to get their own plots of land, essentially ejidos, and the Mexican system was based upon a large part of the population doing. Ex um, subsistence agriculture. And the, the NAFTA change that occurred over a period of time wiped out those subsistence farmers. And the soybean growers, I mean the corn growers and bean growers in, in the United States had a huge market. They made profits. But it wiped out the entire uh, Mexican uh, 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 Small farming sector, and that's what caused the migrations, the desperation, everything. And this is an ex this is one of the best examples of why NAFTA was a uh, was a complete disaster for all of North America because Mexico is part of North America, and what happens in Mexico has a lot to do with what happens in Canada and the United States. Dr. Chang has something you want to say as well. I really want to echo that position. I, I wrote about the uh, agricultural trade policy within the WTO, analyzing the, uh, the impact of the huge amount of agricultural subsidies in European Union, United States, is destroying the f small farms in uh, Mexico and Latin American countries, which is producing migration and then, you know, when they come here, we blame them, right? Like they are the, fr the criminals and other, right? So we, America, destroyed through the agricultural policy their small farms. And in, within America, it's also the small farms that are increasingly more dominant by big farms and then supported by a huge amount of subsidy. We're talking about billions of dollars. So, so the current discussion of migration is totally, you know, it's all totally about morals and other things that is missing the picture is that we are create we meaning the United States creating all this. Uh, Andres Lopez, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the new president in Mexico, just wrote a letter to Trump and called for renegotiation of NAFTA. But in the course of the letter did say that there needs to be economic development, not just for Mexico, but Central America, I don't know if you mentioned South America, but said that that exact issue, without that economic development, you're going to have this uh, immigration crisis. So that's at least interesting. Right? Yeah, that it's out that's there. The <laughs> um, I think Kevin's up next, but I'd just like to point out to people too that under NAFTA, NAFTA is the template for TPP, for CETA, for all of the rest. And whatever is applied, has been applied under NAFTA will be applied under all of those agreements as well. They're using it as the template. And you see what that template has done in terms of trade, in terms of loss of sovereignty, in terms of loss of, of, of working for the uh, national interests of the common good. So it's something to think about. Go ahead, Kevin. 
So I think we have uh, about four competing conceptions here that, that there are some, some conflicts between them, but uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, their insightful presentations in presenting those different conceptions. Um, to recap, I think you have uh, the rule of law, as mentioned, uh, the rule of the majority, which is democracy, uh, the rule of the sovereign, the nation state, um, and then the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules. Uh, each of those are fallible, They're, they have flaws, you know, but um, I, I think there, there's a way that we can rise above all these and bring about a congruence with natural law, with universal law, which is, and I'll pose this as a question, is there a way that we can um, go forward uh, in a more universal concept uh, of economy in a, in a lawful way that we can bring this lawfulness to all of these areas. Do you want to have a lot of help? Yeah. Okay. I'd like to hear Paul too. <laughs> um, Apparently he wants your answer too, Paul. But go ahead, Al. My, my own personal feeling is implementing the one belt, one road in Canada, the United States, Mexico, Central America and South America is going to be necessary to make it all happen. It's already starting to happen in South America. To a more limited extent, it's happening in Central America. In fact, I just, I work with a company in Texas, and we've been working on a project in Guatemala, one of the railroads. Right now. Uh, what's going to happen, we don't know. In Mexico, obviously the new president, uh, Emmanuel uh, López Obrador is very much interested in economic development, and without that, we're we're, we're never going to get anywhere. And, and these policies that have destroyed small farming and so forth, and retarded industrialization and so forth, have to be ended. Uh, that's my opinion. Okay. Um, your question was very beautiful. Um, the the issues posed by the Belt and Road Initiative, which is more than just transportation grids, it's the industrial transformation of the world, it's the bringing nations together around a common, a common good, a common mutual benefit. And that process itself is coherent with um, of, uh, with, with universal natural law, uh, of, which is the, the concept of the good. And you, but you cannot do that without the engagement of, of the various parties involved. And yes, there are innumerable problems, and there's all these issues, but only through the engagement of the various different cultures and various different nations and various different societies in the joint development of the planet through the initiating process of the Belt and Road, can you actually work out, can they actually work something out? If you, if you don't have that engagement, if you don't have at least the commitment to, 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 to doing these things, you cannot develop that relationship with understanding. Now, I already, uh, we've already started to see a change in the Middle East because of the promise of the Belt and Road. You're already starting to see a change in Africa. You're already starting to see a change in, in Latin America. But it's not a change immediately economically. It's a change in the disposition of these nations to each other. And I think the idea of having a common destiny of mankind, a common f future for mankind, even though we have very different uh, traditions, religions, cultures, different systems, we know, uh, um, Dr. Zhang, you know, you know, you're talking about different business systems and different things. These things have to be worked out, and they they're not going to be worked out except through uh, a an engagement process, where the ultimate objective is the development above all else. So I'm going to leave it at that. Want to add one thing? Um, you know, I think it's a we didn't have a lot of time to go through it, but. The ideas that Mr. LaRouche and his wife Helga, the founder of the Schiller Institute, um, 
you know, developed around the new paradigm was based explicitly against the policies of geopolitics. And, geopol the, and you know, if you look at geopolitics, the, the Wikipedia entry for the godfather of geopolitics is Helford Mackinder, and this is British geopolitics, which has its roots in Venice before that, and Rome before that, but it's always the same idea that there's a limited set of resources, there needs to be this imperial force that sort of manages the resources and ultimately uh, controls things and pits nations against each other, the so-called divide and conquer strategy and so forth. And what Mr. LaRouche develops as a really a, a breakthrough in economic science is develops a new metric for what value is, is that we're not limited to resources as humanity. Animals might be, right? They don't have, they have a set resource base that all squirrels do the same thing, all, you know, dolphins do the same thing, whatever, right? We invent resources. We make new resources, such as, was oil always a resource? For a farmer that had oil in their, you know, plot of land, it was a curse until the combustion engine, and then they were millionaires. Right? Same thing with uranium, it was a heavy rock until Einstein, Planck, Meitner, you know, they actually developed the breakthroughs in the unseen domain of principle and through those scientific breakthroughs made the application to technology that actually could provide a new foundation. So think of this, what if we actually develop fusion technology? You know, there's all this discussion now, the Chinese, part of their lunar program is ultimately to be mining helium-3, which is the perfect fuel for fusion power. Now, maybe we don't have the breakthrough now, but what if we did? All this discussion about limited resources, limited water, with, with fusion power we could desalinate at rates unseen, you know, there would be no water issues. Uh, you could transform literally well, there's a concept of the fusion torch, which is a fusion furnace that you could literally throw garbage in it, and, and the plasmas are so hot that you could lit, spit raw materials out of the other end, so garbage could be one of our greatest resources. Like, these are the things that are the potential, and what Mr. LaRouche developed is that because we're not fixed to a certain population density, given our resource base, but that we can develop a new potential, he developed a metric called potential relative population density, which deals with your cultural development, <coughs> scientific development, and so on, that gives you this new capability. And that has actual real value. And so I think the question of natural laws, first off, recognizing we're not animals, we're not fixed to a uh, limited resource base, we're not, therefore, uh, it's the zero-sum game that one nation's rise through wealth, requires beating another nation down, but instead you literally can have win-win economic cooperation. You can have economic relations based on mutual benefit if you are applying your economic activity to the development of new uh, conceptions, new science, and that resulting in these new technologies. And so I think that's the fundamental issue. And to be honest, you know, we didn't really have much time to go through it, but these nations that are moving on the Belt and Road Initiative these were the discussions sparked by Lyndon and Helga LaRouche. They were posing the new Silk Road at the end of the 1980s. And in the 90s, we were holding seminars in Beijing. So even before 2013, when Xi Jinping announced it, we were having the dialogues by we, meaning the Schiller Institute and, and the LaRouches, were having the dialogues that became the foundation for what is actually in motion. And I don't think that could be separated from the, the political or geopolitical processes where people say, well, is China doing a new imperial thing? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Well, you actually have to look at the discussion process which, which initiated some of this. Now, that's not a fixed thing. It's not like you can just say, oh, just because that was what we were talking about in the 90s, that ensures that what China is doing is the right thing. That's always a, uh, it's, it's sort of like the, we all have to be involved in making sure it moves in the right direction. It's kind of like what Ben Franklin said when they was asked what kind of government we had at, after the Constitutional Convention. He says, well, we have a republic if you can keep it. 
So I think it's our engagement that we have to set the concept of what natural law is and the development concepts to you know make sure that it moves forward. Okay, Stuart, you're up next. I, I hope it's going to be a question, Stu. Yeah. I think this question, the uh, well, <clears throat> this is what brought me actually to the uh, to the Larouche group, the Larouche movement, was this understanding of the physical basis of progress. And it started with the adoption of fire about 800,000 years ago. No other animal uses fire on a regular basis. And it's been a continuous succession to higher and higher levels of energy density, flux density through, through per capita. Everything it dri drives around for energy. Now, <coughs> the... <coughs> Question? The, uh, yeah, I forgot this. I got off on a tangent there. Questions do. Well, yeah, I know. The, <laughs> no, I think actually Hal or David covered a lot. I think he answered the question, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think we're going to, thanks everybody. I think we're going to wrap things up. I'd like to thank you. Oh, you have one more question? I just want to ask you, is it very difficult to get next to Trump and put some you know, ideas into his head. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't listen. <laughs> Who wants yes, to? Oh, go ahead. He's going to ask that. I've, I've had some uh, communications with uh, Trump I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I, I've had some personal communications with him. They seem remarkably easy to deal with and to get to and getting responses out of as compared to previous administrations. Well, does he understand what you're, what you're saying, Joe? Um, what I have brought to them is very simple to understand. Uh, I haven't brought science, uh, but the one thing that I, I think they would like to do, but they have a they have a political dichotomy in the Republican Party is infrastructure. Yeah, well, on the one hand, you want to build it, but at the same time, you've got all the right wing conservatives who said the only thing we need to do is cut the budget. You you, you can't make these coexist. Yeah. No. Now, uh, there's some political dilemmas there. But I think it's something that, that we have to address as a country. I, I think so. What are you going to say? Um, I have something very quick to say. Um, I am told that uh, Xi Jinping operates on a very high philosophical level. And if you want to know who somebody might be talking to Trump, might be talking some sense to Trump, I think there's a very good possibility that Xi Jinping has been talking sense to Trump. Outside of the particular outside of any particular, you know, deals. Yeah. Okay, we've got one more question. David, go ahead. I have a question for Mr. Blumas and other uh, speakers who may like to comment. You mentioned about NAFTA, which is a very contentious issue right now. And, and I mean, Canadians in general celebrate NAFTA and CETA. And I've heard you mention that that should be just thrown out. Well, the reason that it doesn't benefit Canada, U.S., and Mexico in terms of its population, do you mean that? Or do you mean that commerce actually do not benefit, or do they benefit disproportionately than the corporations and the quote-unquote fat cats and, and so on? And, and the other question I want to ask Mr. Christie, as you represent Hilke and the Schiller Institute, is the Schiller Institute of the same position that NAFTA should simply be thrown out? And the other thing is that before you have something to replace it, how is the population and the job protected when you throw something like that out? And what do you replace it with? I mean, I heard some of your proposals, but one can never be sure what Mr. Trump is doing right now and what he intends to do. But simply by going along and say, okay, Mr. Trump will support you, just, let's just throw all these out. But Mr. Trump, what are you replacing this with and when? The new and how is the population protected? <laughs> so maybe the speakers would like to comment on that. So I just want to make sure that I understand whether you, know, you are not proposing for an improved version or is so rotten that you need to completely kill it first and then try to create something. Well, wh what are you advocating? Okay. Very good question. Thank you. Um, you have an existing system. You can't just destroy it. And you can't destroy something 
you can't just wipe it out um, because you're destroying the very the very process, right? The the way the way I see it is that Canada has to go to the table with the concept of what is in the national interest, and it has to it has to negotiate from that standpoint, not from the standpoint of the financial community, and not from the standpoint of of the 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 desires of the um, of 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 the um, uh, the financial interests. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that part of the solution to the NAFTA problem lies in in the expansion of the United States and Canada in the Belt and Road. Because what you're doing is you're um, you're expanding the economic activity of the United States and Canada into the Belt and Road. But without some kind of idea of Canada going forward into the future of what it is that Canada wants, it's going to be very hard to, to come up with, with, a, with a strategy for, for organizing a, uh, a NAFTA. Now, the new president of Mexico seems to be uh, interested in uh, re, uh, uh, organizing the United States into a new relationship. This is what would be what I think is necessary. What Canada so far is trying, seems to be trying to do is to maintain the old order, to maintain the old financial system, to maintain the old order, and they're not looking at their own interests. And that could be you could maybe know more about this than I do, but I think this, that has that's the key key thing that has to happen. Um, Trump Trump can't solve Canada's problems, but Trump has to be confronted with with, with what Canada wants and, 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 and is demanding, but not from the standpoint of preserving the old system. I don't know if that does it, but that's my, my sense of it. Um, well, first off, there, there there's the obvious or the reigning argument for the benefit of these kind of free trade deals, which is it's too difficult to negotiate a bunch of bilateral trade deals. Therefore, let's just do these blanket things. I think that's actually a fraud of an argument if you actually look at the what has occurred, what is the, the proof is in the pudding. The, none of these nations have necessarily benefited any better. There are corporations, cartels, financial institutions that do, but in terms of the nations, it hasn't really worked out. Um, I, I would look at it another way, is that you, in negotiating bilateral trade deals, um, for example, that the thing that's come up on the tariffs, right? The, uh, either it was Wang Yi or Li Keqiong made the point that rather than these punitive trade measure, or, uh, tariffs where you know, it's one nation punishing the other, why don't we deal with trade imbalances, which obviously there are, deal with trade imbalances by joint ventures in third countries and expand overall trade. And through expanding overall trade, we can deal with some of the imbalances. I think that same approach should be taken between the United States and Canada. I think it should be taken between the United States and Mexico. I think uh, uh, Lopez Obrador's proposal, like, hey, why, don't, why aren't we developing these nations as a means to ensure that we don't have this immigration crisis and so on. Like, that's the, the principle that should be applied. Now, does that all have to be done according to bilateral negotiations? And can you never have many nations that set up some free trade agreement? You know, I think, we, we, I think it probably could be accomplished both ways. I think one of the things, and this is just my opinion, this isn't uh, uh, what, the opinion of the Schiller Institute or Lennon or Helga LaRouche, I do think Trump has a sense of the unfairness of these things and what people perceive as a uh, uh, irresponsibility or he's just kind of doing a bunch of stuff is he is uprooting this stuff. It is this art of the deal stuff. People have referred to this, that he wrote this book where he sort of pushes things to the brink and then, and then tries to use that as the negotiating table. Maybe that's part of what he's doing. 
Um, but I think it's the, the deeper point is to actually resolve these things, you, we need to expand overall trade. And I, the, the, I, one other thing I'd just like to make on this Belt and Road, we're not lauding simply, or at least the Schiller Institute is not lauding simply what China is doing over in Eurasia, and that this is all about Eurasia. The main, one of the key economic advisors, the name slips me uh, right now, Li Yuhu, I think it is, um, for Xi Jinping, has written papers and studied what Franklin Roosevelt did. So, in other words, what China is doing is taking a page from, I think Paul referenced this, the Hamilton, Hamiltonian perspective, Roosevelt, so we need to be doing the same thing here. It's not just that we're supporting what China is doing in, you know, across the Pacific Ocean. We have to do the exact same model here. And that's one way to deal with some of these trade disparities is expand uh, trade and development or economic development. And that's, I think, how some of these disparities should be dealt with. I think it's, uh, it's after nine, guys. I think we're going to wrap things up. I just have yeah, a hand for everybody. Thanks for your great questions. Anybody wants to hang around, you're welcome to and talk to people. Sorry, I was just I was going to close with just a couple of statements. Um, uh, sorry, I won't be long. I just want to recap because uh, this was very interesting discussion, in depth discussion. There's a lot of ideas that um, that if they're new to you, you, you really have to. Um, take them in and you know so I, I wrote some notes about the overarching concepts that came across to me uh, partly sparked by the natural law question um, you know what what is coming out of China is a, is a Confucian orientation as well uh, Xi Jinping is promoting Confucianism and I have looked at Confucianism um, and you know the motto of our organization is uh, peaceful international relations through cooperative economic development. And this is a fundamental idea underlying Confucianism as well in its history, um, and also how you go about those international relations from one country to another. So um, part of the new paradigm, as it Helga has discussed, is the best of each culture coming together. And if Confucianism is the best of, of that culture, which I would consider it is, and we have a Renaissance tradition uh, in European, which extends into North America, um, we can find these, these um, the, the best of each and every culture and bring them together, but it requires dialogue, and it requires that the people have a voice, and that there is more control, I believe, over our economy, first and foremost for those discussions to happen. Infrastructure allows those things to happen. Development allows those things to happen where people aren't struggling for their very survival every single day. So on that note, um, my last idea that I came to me was that a lot of these ideas are thoroughly discussed in this book. Um, we talk about um, uh, the, the deregulation, uh, which the, the question came from that table over there about Glass-Steagall, and uh, bank separation, um, NAFTA, all of these things have combined for a perfect storm. So we do go through the history of how we got here, but we are also presenting the concept that Dave discussed, which is energy flux density, uh, relative population uh, density as well, which includes culture, which includes economics, it includes all of these things. And we have to, we have to continue that dialogue. So I wanna applaud our speakers, for coming. I want to applaud you all for coming as well. And I do hope we continue this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Paul to stay up here. I'm going to ask uh, Dong uh, Sheng, uh, um, Professor Zhang as well, and um, uh, Dave Christie to come up. Now, um, so we, we ended uh, earlier than we thought, and we'd really like to get some dialogue going, some questions. Uh, Phil is going to uh, help facilitate the uh, question and answer. So um, 
all of these speakers will um, share the mic. And whoever has any questions, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, we'll get going with our discussion. Um, just to remind everybody, I think I said this in the beginning, um, Helga, uh, while she gave a pre-recorded message, uh, since she's not here, Dave uh, Christie from Seattle is representing uh, essentially Helga and the Schiller Institute. So anything you want to ask him about the international situation um, with regards to the Schiller Institute, please go ahead and ask him as well. So anybody who has any questions can just make their way up to the mic and then address the person that you're asking the question to, and we'll go from there. Just quickly as well, uh, also being a part of the LaRouche Act, uh, LaRouche Political Action Committee and member of the Policy Committee, if anybody has questions on the fun political situation in the United States, <laughs> feel free. Sure, go ahead with your question. Uh, the question is directed to Dr. Professor Chan. Okay. Uh, I just want you to tell us what you think about the last two speakers' uh, position on that perhaps we should do away with our law and order system in order to quote unquote get things done. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. That's a very, that's a very, very good question. Um, um, so maybe I can talk about this from my own experience, right? So as as an immigrant, that I, I grew up in Beijing. I went to school there before coming to the United States. So. Um, I think the, the speakers, we have a total agreement that, that Canada should be part of One Belt One Road, uh, that there should be more action. But one thing that I admire when I came to the United States in 1995, and I'm I'm always a great admirer of Canadian democracy is that um, efficiency matters, but efficiency has to be based on deliberative democracy. And, and so, so in that sense, is uh, I, I I think of course it's crucial for Canada to be a integrated economy as an integrated polity uh, no question about that but, but I, what I'm inspired is that when you gave every social group every in, including indigenous groups the opportunity to be part of the deliberation. I think that's really the crucial value of Canada, crucial value in Western democracy. Um, <coughs> when you talk about huge projects, uh, either here or in the one Belt one road countries, because one of the one Belt one road countries, you also building infrastructures, cutting through some of the ecologically very fragile regions. So, so in that sense, how we in Canada can set an example um, to bring all the scientific evidence together and then democratic process together in making the decisions. Of course, you know, I sh totally share the, the sense of urgency, the sense of that we need to have a lot of things done, our infrastructure is becoming outdated. Uh, we literally experienced driving to uh, Vancouver from Seattle. <laughs> so, um, and I also have the experience that, you know, you go to China, you, you uh, 
on the highway or on a high speed train is is very efficient, right? Very good quality uh, highway. Um, but I, I, I think the dignity of our communities, our indigenous groups, uh, cannot can never be sacrificed uh, for the sake of efficiency. I think I think that's really a the soul of Western democracy we Thank have. You. So, so that's my view. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-on question? What do you want to do, Dave? Just, I just would like to ask a, a follow-on question that's directly related to that question because in the course of these discussions, it seems there is um, somewhat of the question of the private versus the public. And obviously, Professor Zhang gave a very, uh, uh, you know, solid argument on this question of if you let state-run enterprises and they're not accountable to any sort of international law that there's going to be the question of private investment and meshing the two becomes a very tricky discussion. Um, now on the other hand, I just want to reference one thing that occurred years ago that doesn't seem to have really been discussed or resolved, which was the, the LIBOR scandal. This is the London Interbank Offer Rate, which supposedly is to set market rates for all kinds of lending. And it would be kind of an example of the way that private finance would set a certain standard for uh, rates from everything, you know, municipal bonds and so on and so forth, not alone, let alone the, the uh, banking rates or the interest rates that banks offer and so forth, right? So, but they were, sh the, what was found to be the case is when the scandal broke out about the London Interbank offer rate, the top banks, which it's essentially a conglomerate of market rates for you know what lending goes for, and what they were doing was rigging the rates, and and so then they were running scams and so forth. But point is, is there's an example of where you have private interests setting so-called standards for what should be interest rates and, and uh, ultimately the kind of legal framework that goes for investment contrasted to what Dr. Zhang laid out very clearly is that you don't also don't want to have purely state enterprises which can just pull the plug on things based on sovereign immunity. So it seems to me that somewhere in the middle lies uh, between the private and the public, you want to have some competent sense of how those two interests can work to a common good or a harmony of interests. Actually, that was what uh, um, uh, Henry C. Carey discussed it as. So I mean, maybe I just have a general question to any of you on the panel about, and maybe with Dr. Zhang, maybe how do you have a sense of the legal framework to sort of deal with that? Because in addition to LIBOR, then of course you have the City of London, which is totally shady. I mean, it's a, as a corporation, it's, it doesn't even really operate under UK law. It has all these offshore banking centers, Jersey, the Cayman Islands, and then they sort of just pretend like it's in this legal gray zone. So, so anyway, so I'm making the point that leaving it up to private financial interests to set these standards, also, as Dr. Zhang laid out, sovereignty issues, it seems like somewhere in the middle is a, a workable solution. So I... Dr. Cooper wants to speak. Um, I can give you some examples that are going on right now in the United States. We have two private sector high-speed rail project uh, financing underway right now, and the money is completely private. There is no public money in either of these projects. One of them is Florida, I talked about, the Brightline Project. Um, they have been successful in getting their system off the ground. Now, it helped that the company who's doing this owns the railroad already. That was very helpful. And they have to build 40 million mile, miles of new railroad between uh, Cocoa Beach and Orlando, but they'll get that done. And it looks like they're going to get the approval from the state of Florida to build along Interstate 4 with a high-speed rail. And then they'll go up to Jacksonville from Orlando, and that's going to work. 
Um, they are successful in raising money, and in fact, you have a lot of other states now coming to them saying, look, can you can build us uh, something in our state. Uh, I know in Arizona, just last week they were in Arizona, just to give an example. Now, the other one is in Texas, and that's the Texas Central Railway, which is being built between Houston and Dallas. It's 240 miles, uh, almost exactly the same distance as between Orlando and Miami with the uh, Brightline project. Now, that's being done in conjunction with the Japanese. Uh, so far, they've raised $200 million. Um, they've gone through all the design phases. They've done, got the environmental uh, studies, uh, impact studies done. They've gotten the permits, and they are now uh, underway with beginning planning for construction with detailed engineering. And they have retained Bechtel Corporation as their project manager, who certainly knows lots about building major projects. Now, those uh, are underway. Now, there's a third project. California High Speed Rail. That's been done under the state of California. And uh, they are in the process of building between uh, just the north end of Bakersfield and up near uh, Madeira. Uh, they've been having problems raising money, and one of the main reasons is the Republicans, including in the California congressional delegation, have been doing everything possible to prevent them from getting money. Uh, it hasn't been successful so far, but also uh, the state. Uh, only offered a bond issue of $8 billion on a project that's probably between $50 and $75 billion or more. Uh, it's had some problems. Uh, will it get built? Yes, eventually, but uh, it's going to take some time. And it's not privately funded, but it will pass some private uh, financing with it. My su suggestion to anyone who's looking at this is having had some experience, you need to have a joint venture. The government can be involved if it wants as an equity investor, okay? or a lender, or a guarantor, any one of those are possible. If the Chinese or other foreign interests come in, they can be equity investors in that state. Now, the Japanese are already involved as investors in the project in Texas to the tune of six to ten billion dollars is what they agreed to put up. The rest of it's going to have to be raised domestically. In Florida, it's all it's all American money. And they're using Siemens equipment, which is manufactured in Sacramento by Siemens Corporation. Siemens is only a supplier of equipment. They aren't doing anything else in the project. Uh, so there are some, some models. Um, now, in California, the Chinese were approached about putting up to forty million dollars into the project. And while they were initially interested, I, and I know this because China Rail Construction Company, uh, their manager, told me what happened with the negotiations. They were extremely concerned that there was going to be an environmental lawsuit filed after they put the money up, and it was going to stop the project, and they could get to write off $40 million. They felt there was a very serious risk, and especially in California, where you have all the environmental lawyers. Okay. That's my opinion. And then there's the xenophobia aspect of it. Of it. Pardon? And there's the xenophobia aspect. So, uh, yes, I, I would say that's true too. But I, I'll let you write the comment on that. Can, can, you, can you explain why GOP of, uh, in California is objecting to it? Very simply, because it was the Democrats doing it. Ah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Personal. We, we have another person at the mic. We want to continue yeah. in that manner and not jump around too much, okay? So, go ahead, Stu. On this issue of liberalism versus efficiency, or however you wish to pose that uh, contradiction, I think there's a tendency to ignore our own history. <clears throat> Canada's primary industrialization took place during and just after the Second World War. It was a massive forced march because for 10 years the country languished in, in the Depression was in far worse shape than the United States. We didn't have a New Deal here. All happened in the Second World War. Massive industrial development. It needs to be remembered that Canada lived under the War Measures Act from 1939 to 1949. The War Measures Act sets every legal guarantee aside. It wipes it out. The government can do whatever it wants, when it wants, as it wants. 
It was under the War Measures Act that the Japanese Canadians were deported from the West Coast and set up to the interior in Alberta where I, where I grew up. It was under the War Measures Act that it was made, you were, it was illegal to quit your job during the war. You'd go to jail for that. It was under the War Measures Act that they introduced, of course, the consumer ration. It was also under the War Measures Act that they rationed bank credit so that it only went to productive processes, as Paul mentioned. Under the War Measures Act, it went on until, I thought it had ended earlier, but I found out that it actually only ended in 1949 because one of my teachers, when I was going to high school in Caswell, had been one of the deportees. Her name is Aya Gashi. And I mentioned that I'd run across a guy in Toronto who had been an apprentice sawyer in a sawmill up in Kamloops in 1948. He was 16, and the RCMP still had control of him, and they told him he had to leave and get out of the province. This was 1948. So I said it ended then, and then my teacher told me, because I she never mentioned any of this when I was in high school, of course, that it actually never ended. They were still under the control of the RCMP until 1949. So the massive uh, industrialization that Canada underwent was not done under a liberal regime. We need to understand our history a little better. Now let's look at South Korea. 1953, it was a bombed out basket case, primarily agricultural. The bulk of the industry that the Japanese had put in there was in the north. It had been fought over about three times, bombed and shelled 15 ways in the middle. Now we look at it, Canada as an industrial backwater instead of the fourth largest power in the world as it was in 1953. And South Korea is an industrial superpower. What happened? Stu, have you got a question? Yeah, I got okay. it. I, it's a question. I think it's, it just needs to be added, added to the situation. South Korea came under a military dictatorship of Park Chung-hee who launched a five-year program of industrialization, forced industrialization, very much along the lines of what they did in the Soviet Union during the 30s. Now, I think we need to understand that liberalism is often illusory, that the real push, the real forced marches into the 20th century and the 21st century took place under very illiberal regimes, and I think if you Dig, dig down deep enough, you'll find that in most of the major countries. Did you want to ask a question? No, that's good. Just making a statement. Okay. <laughs> Just check it. <laughs> Anybody else want to come to the mic and ask a question? Oh, Mike's getting up. Robbie's going over there. Yes, Mike, go ahead. A uh, question for Paul uh, or anyone else on the panel who has uh, some thoughts on this. Um, it seems to me that the, the re I know a little about American history, but it seems to me that the removal of the Glass-Steagall Act possibly wasn't a very strongly opposed decision by the American government. The imposition of the Glass-Steagall Act in the first place I would have thought might have been more difficult, but of course times must have been very different. I don't know when that act was brought into force. So, so my question is, how much have times changed since the original imposition of the Glass-Steagall Act, and how could it possibly be reimposed today? It seems to me like it would be much a matter of trying to unmake the omelette, and I'd like your opinion, Paul, or anyone else who wants to answer. Okay. Could you pass the mic, Paul? Basically... Just um, where you get the mic, Paul. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. But ba use the mic. Okay, you want me to use the mic? Yes. I'm pretty loud, and I don't want to hurt people's ears so loud. Uh, basically, the Glass-Steagall Act was a response to the collapse of the banking system in the United States in 1933. As President Roosevelt was being inaugurated, the banking system had collapsed and the country faced a complete collapse as a result. So FDR set up a bank holiday and uh, got the, uh, this 
piece of legislation through the U.S. Congress uh, under Carter Glass and, and somebody by the name of Stephen. And what it did was it um, established uh, a regular uh, bank regulation such that the banking, the commercial banking system was no longer under the control of holding companies. And prior to that, the holding companies would funnel all the funds out of the bank, out of the deposit base into, and, and, and bankrupt the banks. So, it's, and leave the depositors, uh, and leave the, uh, 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 there was no protection for the depositors. So, they added a protection to deposits, and they forbid the commercial banks from being engaged in any form of speculation. In fact, it was very strictly regulated. There were you were regulated, you couldn't go outside the state you were in, you, you, um, everything was regulated. And gradually those regulations were, were uh, watered down or were whittled down until the final deregulation was in uh, 1999 when they uh, passed the, uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall in the U.S. Congress. But the same thing had already happened in Great Britain and, and 1986, the same thing had already happened in Canada in 1987. The United States was just um, a much bigger country and much more, uh, it happened uh, later. From that moment on, the, the U.S. banking system increasingly became, just like the Canadian banking system and other banking systems, increasingly became um, the private property of the charter of the investment houses who also control the brokerage firms. And that was, from that moment on, you went from one bubble to another bubble to another bubble to another bubble to another, to 19, 2008, until finally now. And you have to reestablish that kind of control if you, if you uh, want to not have uh, a financial collapse uh, cause a systemic breakdown of society. And, 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 and it's the threat of a financial collapse, which is at the center of the power of these mega banks, is that, well, you don't bail us out, you, you know, everything's gonna collapse and you have to do what we, you know, you have to keep bailing us out. So, so these, we call it bank separation, and bank separation is one of the first antidotes to, to, the, um, uh, to the threat that, to the democracy sword, which holds is, is held over nations, and over our over Canada, there was a significant bailout that they don't talk about that Canada did, um, and, and 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 as well. So, so that's basically it. Um, okay, that's all I'm going to say. Um, I just like to add something to that. Like, um, I I don't feel the question was completely answered. Maybe I didn't phrase it very well, but. And my, my question is, is, well, is based on a, a hunch that our circumstances today are very much, and the United States circumstances today are very much different from what they were when the glass to Act provisions were put into place. And, and uh, it may be impossible or okay, far I can more you. difficult okay. to reimpose okay. the Act, um, if you understand. Yes. And also, there is a problem internationally. So, th there's going to have to be a new um, financial architecture on a global scale to go with this. Because you're not gonna be able to uh, contain, you're not gonna be able to deal with this, with the, with this financial crisis, you know, uh, simply by um, doing it in one country. You, you're gonna have to have a new financial architecture. That's now on the table. That's now being discussed public, uh, privately and publicly between nations. So what are we gonna do? Um, China's discussing this, Russia's discussing this, other nations are discussing this, you know, and how do we, how do we deal with, with, this, with this system? And yes, it, there is a change, but the principles remain the same. The, there, there's, there's, a, there's a very, Different situation, but the principles remain the same. Could I add something? Um, Go ahead. I think because one of the arguments that was made, as Paul just mentioned, the the uh, uh, the break in Great Britain in '86, Canada '87. Uh, one of the arguments that was made for the repeal of Glass-Steagall, and including 
a, a paper written by Alan Greenspan, I think it was 86, called Rethinking Glass-Steagall. And this was when he was at um, J.P. Morgan. And one of the arguments that was, was, well, now that we have this universal banking concept going on in, in London, et cetera, we have to be competitive in the global market, therefore we need to break away the, the banking separation. Now, here's the side of things. Um, Glass-Steagall, otherwise known as the Banking Act of 1933, it wasn't just bank separation, it was the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation which gave deposit guarantee or guarantees to the commercial banks which took the deposits, made the normal lending, but could not engage in financial speculation. The investment banks were over here, they could engage in financial speculation, but the commercial banks could not. But the investment banks did not get FDIC protection for, for the, what they were doing. It was only the commercial banks that got the FDIC protection. Now, when they repealed Glass-Steagall, they only repealed the banking separation. They left the FDIC in place, which meant that they had a criminal intent, which was to, through breaking down the, the firewall between the commercial banks and the investment banks, that let the speculative ventures of the investment banks jump under a protective umbrella. Merrill Lynch and Bank of America merge, uh, whatever it was, uh, Goldman's, um, uh, J.P. Morgan and uh, Chase, right? And, and so then what they did is they went hog wild with the real estate scam, the mortgage-backed securities and so on. They just issued all kinds of derivatives knowing that because the FDIC was going to have to have the back of these commercial banks, which now had these all these other operations going on, investment banking, insurance activities, etc., which all used to have to be separate, then they used that as the threat to the U.S. government that when the pile blew, and they all knew it was going to blow, blow and I tell you what, there are bankers, investment bankers, who actually say that because of the repeal of Glass-Steagall and because of the, the fact that the speculation is really covered, that it's actually destroyed investment banking, that there's no skill any longer. It's just inventing some exotic financial instrument that uh, you know makes money off of quick margins and nanosecond transactions and so on and so forth, but it's actually killed the skill of investment banking, which used to actually find risky ventures, maybe scientific ventures that you didn't know if it was going to work out or not, but the investment banks would, would take a risk, maybe, and knowing that they would get a higher return, and it wasn't just the low returns that you might get in the commercial banks. So there's actually investment bankers that now, I think it was the head of Barings that said, you know, back in back in the day, you know, the Barings is one of the old British banks, right? And he, and he came out and he said, back in the day, you used to have to put your balls on the block. You know, meaning like you used to actually have to put something out there. Now you don't have to do anything. And so it's actually destroyed investment banking as much as it's destroyed commercial banking. So, so I think there was a that, that was the argument that was made. We have to compete with the universal banking, but what it I think more fundamentally, it, what it actually did is it destroyed a concept of value in an economic system. Money just became money. If you made money off of you know, derivative transactions or you made money off of infrastructure, it was all the same thing. But in reality, it's not. It's what actually provides value, added value to your society by increasing the productive power of your labor force. I think we're going to let Ronnie go ahead. Do you have something to say, uh, Hal? Yes. Uh, Bank of America was forced to take over Merrill Lynch against their own wishes. And after that happened, it basically destroyed their ability to make small loans. There was just one point I was going to make to everybody before you asked a question, Robbie, and that is things are not that great because at the G7 meetings in Australia, which is quite a while back, all of the nations passed legislation for a bail-in procedure. So in other words, they would the um, the assets, in other words, the uh, deposits on on the uh, books of the banks would become assets of the banks. Canada signed it. All of them, all of the G7 nations have signed that. So in other words, they know that things are shaky, and they know that if they need pensions, they need RSPs, they need uh, deposits from everybody else, they can just enact the legislation. The legislation sitting there in all those countries. 
and they just flip the switch and all of that money becomes theirs. It goes from a liability to an asset. So if things are so great, why do they need to do that? So you just need to think about it. Go ahead and ask a question, Robin. Yeah. Um, I hope this question was not asked already uh, when I left the room, but um, for Professor Zhang, um, NAFTA is outside of uh, what you were talking about, and, but also I think in answer to one of the questions from the audience, it was also outside even the uh, sovereign immunity uh, question that you were that you were presenting on. So my question is, um, there seems to be a fundamental difference between a corporation, because in Canada, NAFTA, Chapter 11, uh, the corporations basically have control over the economy. And um, that is, that, that seems contradictory, you know, in what you said about the, the public assets versus the private, or public investments versus private. So can you answer that question just about NAFTA in regards to international law, and where, and where does it sit? Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify. Uh, uh, definitely the current critique, uh, including uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, on this issue is very, very clear from the American uh, progressive side. That is, uh, the, the investor dispute settlement uh, in NAFTA is a new liberal domination of regulatory power of sovereign states uh, through which the big corporations, as you said, that uh, dominates the, the process, right? And this kind of, is, this is a very powerful tool because in a normal situation, if you're not a foreign investor under NAFTA, you have no power to bring a sovereign power to a arbit private arbitration process, right? So in that sense, it's an infringement of the regulatory power of a sovereign state. I, I think uh, probably we all share in this room that you know, for the progressives, part of the, the, the mission is to let the sovereign power to exercise that public authority on behalf of the, all the people. So, so in that sense, that we've been dominated by this new liberal uh, structure since you know, in trade in 1994 is a huge landmark, right? So that was the formation of NAFTA, formation of the WTO, formation of the European uh, Union integration. And then China, you know, 93 was also a big forward, step forward to privatize a lot of the state-owned uh, enterprises. Uh, so, so in that sense, how to rethink, reimagine that?